Did you know that the Panama Canal allows more than 14,000 ships to pass through it every year? A crazy number, right? Well, the engineering behind the workings of the Panama Canal is even more crazy than you could imagine. It has this smart locking system that lifts ships by almost 20 meters high to take them through the canal safely. Much work and sweat have been put in to achieve this great engineering marvel that we now know as the Panama Canal. But why is this canal project such a big deal? Now, here's the deal. If you can link the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans with water, ships can cut about 20,000 kilometers off their journey. And the best spot to make this canal dream happen is in the narrow region of Panama. Panama is a breathtaking country with some seriously rough terrain. Just take a look at this cross section of the land. It's proof of how rugged it is. The simplest idea is to dig across this land, letting the oceans on both sides meet up. And voila, ships can keep on sailing. Well, the French gave this exact plan a shot in 1892, and let's just say, it didn't go well. Landslides, heavy rain, and disease made life really tough. Clearing out the earth took almost eight years and sadly, nearly 22,000 people lost their lives. Eventually, they had to throw in the towel, and the project was abandoned. In 1904, the Americans had a brilliant idea. Instead of digging up the entire earth, they figured, why not just remove some of these massive mountains and flood the stretch of land with water? So, what they did was fill only a narrow width with water, avoiding flooding the entire country of Panama. Now, as long as the ship is lifted onto this new elevated water surface, it can smoothly cross Panama. But how did they manage to lift a heavy ship to this new water level? Here's the simple trick. If an object can float on water just by increasing the water level, it will be lifted. To pull off this trick in the construction of the Panama Canal, they first installed three gates at the entrance. Now, once the first gate is open, the ship enters the space between the two gates. Once they close the first gate and fill it with water from the second chamber, both water levels reach the same height, and the ship automatically rises. Once the water levels are equal, they open the second gate, allowing the ship to smoothly enter the next chamber. After closing the second gate, they repeat the water leveling process. After a few more rounds of this, the ship can easily enter the raised water platform, and just like that, it continues its journey through this incredible shortcut in Panama. Now, when the ship reaches the end of the canal, it needs to be lowered back to sea level. To achieve this, they simply perform the same water leveling technique in the exact opposite sequence. In this ingenious method, Raising and lowering is a completely gravity-based process. No external energy is required for this operation. However, there's a small issue. When the first ship enters the canal, the ocean and chamber water levels are the same. So, after it's fully raised, an extra water step forms in the first chamber. This extra water needs to be released into the ocean so that the next ship can enter the chamber. This additional water comes originally from Lake Gatun. Therefore, with the passage of each ship, Gatun Lake loses water. Without correcting this issue, Gatun Lake would eventually dry up completely and the operation of the Panama Canal would cease. Fortunately, that's not the case for now because Gatun Lake is supplied by the Chagres River, which gets its water from local rainfall in the Panama province. So as long as there is sufficient rain, the water loss during each ship crossing is easily compensated for. However, if the water level in Panama becomes too low drought will set in and some shippers will be forced to limit the amount of cargo in order to safely navigate the waterway. Now let's address the big question. How did they flood this exact region of Panama? Well, first, they constructed a dam. The water stream from the Chagres River would accumulate within the dam region forming the newly created water body known as Gatun Lake, one of the largest man-made lakes. By controlling the dam height or the water surface height, they could achieve different levels of flooding. Unfortunately, flooding only this region without submerging the entire country of Panama proved impossible. To avoid widespread flooding, American engineers decided to stop at the current water level, leaving almost two-thirds of the land underwater and only a small portion above. Now, the real challenge begins, the removal of the remaining 15-kilometer-long unflooded region, also known as the formation of Culebra Cut, with the sole purpose of connecting the dam and the ocean. 
So it's time to dig. Gigantic machines like the track shifter, dirt spreader, and unloader were specifically invented for this purpose. The Calibre cut involved removing three times more soil than the French initially estimated. Even the Americans couldn't anticipate the need for such a massive excavation, primarily due to landslides. All materials have an angle of repose and for the Calibre region, a low angle of repose was crucial for a stable cut. After years of earth removal, the Calibre cut was almost ready, with the last challenge being a heightened portion of rock called the Gamble Dyke. To address this, the Americans took on the challenge with style. On October 10, 1913, American President Woodrow Wilson was given the honor of blasting the Gamble Dyke all the way from America with 7,000 kilograms of dynamic by pressing a button. An extensive electrical cable network, mostly underwater, transferred the president's signal to Panama. The signal took four seconds to reach its destination, causing a spark and a giant explosion that left a gap of 60 feet at Gamble Dyke. The water in Gatton Lake immediately rushed to the Culebra Cut. Finally, the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans met for the first time. A moment of great pride not only for Americans, but for the entire world celebrating this historical achievement. Now let's delve into the details of a ship's transit across the Panama Canal. When a cargo ship nears the locked chamber of the canal, the ship's propeller must be turned off. The ship is then moved by two tugboats, as no ship is allowed to pass through the locked chamber under its own power. These ships are perfectly aligned with the canal gate, thanks to the sideways push of these tugboats. Just before the ship enters the lock chamber, canal workers tether it to four electric locomotives called mules. These locomotives travel on either side of a lock wall on a high voltage rail track, guiding the ship carefully to avoid hitting the lock walls. The Panama Canal locks are so well designed that today's massive ships can safely travel through with only inches to spare. After climbing the final water step, the ship reaches the famous Culebra Cut, followed by Gatton Lake, while cruising across the lake, passengers can enjoy the scenic beauty of Panama. Once the ship reaches the end of the cut, it's lowered using the reverse water step method. Now let's marvel at another engineering feat, the gates of the canal also known as miter locks. Originally designed by the great Leonardo da Vinci around 500 years ago, the genius design of the miter locks forms a watertight joint automatically. These gates play a crucial role in the smooth operation of the Panama Canal, showcasing the timelessness of Da Vinci's ingenuity. All right guys, that wraps up our video for today. What do you think about the Panama Canal engineering? And do you think it will last the test of time? Let us know your thoughts in the comments section below. If you found this useful, please do well to subscribe to EVOLV ING Engineering for more mind-blowing engineering marvels.